Uh, hi, I'm Liz Burning at the ZOA Book Club. We welcome everybody here. And uh, today we're discussing What is Life Worth um, by Kenneth Feinberg. And we're very pleased to have Kenneth Feinberg with us today. Um, and we've had many fine authors in our book club, but this is only the second time that we've had somebody. The first one was the Red Sea Diving Club, um, who uh, published a book that became a movie, which is uh, extremely interesting for us. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Liz, thank you, Alan, and thank you, Zionist Organization of America. Very nice. Uh, I never thought when I wrote What Is Life Worth? Uh, the unprecedented effort to compensate the victims of 9-11, I never thought that the book would ever become a movie. And I thought that um, proof of that uh, is the fact that for 10 years, really um, 12 years, the producers of the film every two years simply extended their exclusive contract with me to make the movie. They paid me a fee every two years. I told them, you're throwing good money after bad. They can't, I don't think there can be a movie made out of my experiences with the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund. They said, no, we want to continue to maintain exclusivity. Finally, in 2018, out of the clear blue, I received a hefty check. According to the contract, that check was 50% of the ultimate cost they would pay me for the book rights and would only become due and owing when they had a script and were contemplating casting and filming the film. And from 2018 until 2019, I was constantly uh, being um, approached by the producers and the screenwriter, Max Borenstein, to assist my input into the script, the movie script. And then in 2019, out of the clear blue, the second check arrived with an announcement that Michael Keaton would play Ken Feinberg, Amy Ryan would play my colleague Camille Byros, Stanley Tucci would play a victim, a survivor, uh, Charles Wolf, and, and um, the movie was about to begin filming. And there it was. The movie actually did see, the book did see the light of day. They changed the name of the movie to Worth from What Is Life Worth? And Camille and I went to New York for a few days to meet with Keaton and Amy Ryan and talk about the experiences we went through. We sat with them for hours. And then when the film was actually being filmed, we went back during the filming and were there to comment, monitor, and make suggestions. So I never thought the film could adequately convey what we went through in 9-11. It did. It did a fairly good job, actually, of conveying the atmosphere and the pressures we were under in designing and administering the film. Now, I must say, the film, like most films, uh, take a hefty amount of dramatic license in portraying the book and our experience. And I don't wanna give away anything other than to say to all of you who haven't seen the movie, um, take it with somewhat a grain of salt in terms of some of the dramatic confrontations seen in the movie. I'll just give you one example, which won't um, won't you know give away anything the movie makes it very very clear that there was some sort of cutoff 85 percent of all victims 
under the law had to file a claim under this fund with me before the deadline. 85% was sort of the magic number of victim submissions in the fund that would determine success or failure. Absolutely not true. To the extent in the movie that the clock is ticking and there's only a few more days and they still don't, don't have the sort of magic number of claims, that, that, that's simply not true. What is true is that most people, like in all of these funds, wait and wait and wait until they see the handwriting on the wall concerning deadlines and then file. But there was no arbitrary number or percentage or anything like that. Now, a few things I want to highlight about the 9-11 fund, my book, and the movie. Because what I'm going to say now over the next sort of 15 or 20 minutes applies to the fund, my um, memoir, What Is Life Worth, about the fund, and the movie based on the book. Excuse me, Mr. Feinberg, could, could I ask you to just look a little bit? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, look in that direction <laughs> so that we can see, see your full face. Thank you. First, the fund was unique in the history of this country. The idea that Congress would enact a law providing public taxpayer compensation to only certain victims of a horror is not the American way, you know. Bad things happen to good people every day in this country. There's not a 9-11 fund waiting in reserve to compensate. So the 9-11 fund, I don't think you'll ever see it again. It was a unique response to an, a historical tragedy rivaled only by the American Civil War, Pearl Harbor, and the assassination of President Kennedy. And it ought to be viewed with this historical lens. That's point number one. Point number two, the fund was created by Congress just 13 days after the attacks, before any uh, time delay to allow passion and grief to cool. So we confronted in the 9-11 fund a tremendous um, emotional tsunami in dealing with survivors only weeks after the attacks and before bodies had even been recovered or, or <laughs> injured victims given a chance to heal. It was a tremendous barrier at the outset to success. Third, the fund was incredibly generous with the taxpayers' money. Over the 33 months of the fund, I distributed $7.1 billion in taxpayer money to 5,300 eligible victims and or their families. The fund worked as intended. 97% of all eligible families entered the fund. Only 3% opted out, which was their right, and decided to litigate instead against the airlines, the World Trade Center, Massport, the Port Authority, etc. And those 94 people who opted out, they settled their cases five years later. Some may have got some a little more, some may got a little less, but they all had to give 25% to their lawyers, don't forget. So the fund was a success. I would also say the fund was a success. We uh, accomplished exactly what Congress wanted us to accomplish. I, I point with pride to the fund and how it worked. Don't ever do it again. The idea 
that Congress would set aside public money just for these victims. Everybody else, fend for yourself. Go get a lawyer, go go to judge and jury. That's where you'll get justice. But for these folks and nobody else, we have a very lucrative alternative. You should have read some of the letters I received during my administration of the fund. Dear Mr. Feinberg, my son died in Oklahoma City, a, the victim of a domestic terrorist attack. Where's my check? Dear Mr. Feinberg, I don't get it. My daughter died in the basement of the World Trade Center in the original 1993 attacks committed by the very same type of people. Why aren't I eligible? And it wasn't just terrorism, you see. Dear Mr. Feinberg, last year, my wife saved three little girls from drowning in the Mississippi River, and then she drowned a heroine. We is my check. <laughs> you better be careful about this un-American approach that claims equal protection of the law and then carves out just these 5,300 people to share in $7.1 billion in public money. Don't do it again. And you haven't seen it again. Oh, you've got the 9-11 extension to pay the first responders, their medical treatment, et cetera. But there hasn't been another taxpayer-funded similar program. The BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, that was BP money. That was not the public taxpayer's money. The GM ignition switch, the defective ignition switch program, GM money, not the taxpayer's money. One Fun Boston Marathon, Sandy Hook, Virginia Tech shootings, Aurora, Colorado. Uh, Pulse nightclub attack, terrorist attack, killed 50 people in Orlando, Florida, all private money. So um, private money uh, contributed by private donors around the United States. Tell you one thing you learn, not only from the 9-11 fund, but from all these other programs that I've designed and administered, never underestimate the charitable impulse of the American people. It is astounding to me how the American people, after a tragedy, step up, send in money for the victims. And that's how some of these funds that I've referenced are created by private, donated uh, taxpayer funds. So that's how this worked. Now, I'm asked all the time, and it appears in the movie over and over again, what was the toughest part of the 9-11 fund? Was it calculating the awards for individual victims? No. Calculating the value of a life is not rocket science in the United States. It's done every day in every court, in every village, city, town in the United States. The formula has existed in American law for centuries. What is a life worth? One, how much would the victim have earned over a work life but for the tragedy? A stockbroker, a banker, an accountant, a lawyer. They receive more money from juries than a busboy, a waiter, a cop, a fireman, or a soldier. They earn more, so they get more. Second, add to the economic loss, pain and suffering, emotional distress. There is your jury verdict imposed as part of the American legal system. And there it is. That's how it works. And the Congress in setting up the 9-11 fund basically adopted that system so that I compensated 5,300 people and every one of them got a different amount of money depending on their work experience, 
and what they did for a living and how old they were, you see, how long they would be in the workplace. That wasn't the hardest part of this assignment. By far, the hardest part was the emotion. The emotion. When you set up a program like this, and you set it up so soon after the horror, guaranteed claimants are going to be angry, frustrated, disappointed, uncertain about their future, and they will vent about life's unfairness. Count on it. And we decided, even though it wasn't in the statute, we decided to give every single claimant voluntarily, if they wanted, the opportunity to be heard. Come see Feinberg. Come see my colleague, Camille Byros. Have a hearing in confidence and tell us anything you want to tell us. Well, let me assure this Zionist book club audience, the stories we heard make up the bulk of my book, What Is Life Worth? And frankly, the bulk of the movie from the moment the movie begins. A 26-year-old woman comes to see me sobbing. Mr. Feinberg? I lost my husband at the World Trade Center. He was a fireman. And he left me with our two children, six and four. Now, you're going to provide me from the fund $2.2 million, tax-free. I want it in 30 days. Well, Mrs. Jones, um, this is public taxpayer money. The check has to come from the US Treasury. It may take 60 days or 90 days, but you'll receive the money. No, 30 days. I said to her, Mrs. Jones, why do you need the money in 30 days? Why? I'll tell you why, Mr. Feinberg. I have terminal cancer. I have 10 weeks to live. My husband was going to survive me and take care of our two little ones. Now they're going to be orphans. I have got to get this money while I still have my faculties. I got to set up a trust. I've got to find a guardian. I don't have a lot of time. Well, we raced down to the treasury. We accelerated the check. Eight weeks later, she died. Now, <laughs> You can't make it up, you see. Story after story after story. Mr. Feinberg, I lost my husband. He was a fireman at the World Trade Center. When the plane hit the World Trade Center building, he ran into the lobby and rescued 20 people and brought them to safety to Lower Broadway. But he saw that another 20 were trapped. He ran back in and rescued those 20 and brought them to safety. Mr. Feinberg, while my husband was running across the World Trade Center Plaza, he was killed when somebody jumped from the 103rd floor and hit him like a missile killing them both. If he had taken one step either way, he'd be here today, Mr. Feinberg. Don't tell me there's a God. Don't tell, no God would allow this to happen to my husband. Story after story after story. Now, that's the tough part of this, you see. People ask me, Ken, was your law degree a help in uh, designing and administering the program? And I say, my law background is a wash. 
It didn't help, didn't hurt. Better a degree, a divinity degree, or a degree in psychiatry, because you see the heart and soul of the 9-11 fund and a lot of these other programs Liz mentions, but a lot of these programs, the heart and soul of the program is empathy. Empathy. Staring a victim in the eye and allowing that victim to vent about life's unfairness, you see. And if you don't have empathy and you can't convey empathy, you're going to find a very divisive, angry population of victims. And that empathy is critical. After one fun Boston, the Boston Marathon, I get a call from a victim of the bombing who said to me on the telephone, Mr. Feinberg, you're running this program. I'd like to come and see you, but I can't. I'm at the Spalding Hospital, the rehab hospital in Boston, because the bomb went off and I lost, I lost my left leg at the hip. I said, Mr. Jones, don't worry. I'll get in a taxi. I'll come over to the rehab hospital and I'll meet with you there. And I went over to see him. Well, I walk into his hospital room and sitting on his lap, there's his, his you know, he's got one leg. Sitting on his lap is his nine-year-old son. And around the bed, his wife, his sister, and his brother. And I said to him, I said, Mr. Jones, this is horrible. I want you to know that One Fund Boston will give you a million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars tax-free for the loss of your leg. And I know it, it it's a poor substitute, but I at least want you to know that. He looked at me. Mr. Feinberg, you're going to give me a million two fifty for my leg? Is that what you're telling me? I got a better idea, Mr. Feinberg. Keep your damn money. Give me my leg back. How's that? Give me my leg back. You can have the money back. I don't want the money. I want my leg. Mr. Jones, I wish I could do that. I have no, I haven't got the power. All I can do is provide you some degree of financial assistance. Yeah, isn't that great? Well, I left as fast as I could. There was no point. There's no point. This is the confrontation. You see, this is the emotional overhang in all of these programs. Um, when, when I get a call to get ready to do a program like One Fun Boston, where Governor Menino, uh, Governor Patrick, Deval Patrick, and Mayor Menino in Boston asked me to do it, brace yourself. Brace yourself. It's not the calculations. It's the emotional, um, uh, the emotion that comes with it. And no matter how much I try to empathize and watch myself in how you approach individual claimants, victims, family members, rest assured. I mean, you make mistakes. You make mistakes. You can't help. Human nature being what it is, you can't help. There'll always be mistakes. And you know, it's very interesting about human nature. I've learned most people, when they come to see me, don't really want to talk about compensation, about money. Some do, a few do. But when people want to talk to me about money, they're not upset with what I've the fund is providing them. The, the, they're not questioning the value of the award to them. The problem is in a mass catastrophe like 9-11, everybody counts other people's money. Mr. Feinberg, you're giving me $3 million, but you're giving my next door neighbor $4 million. What do you have against my husband? You never even knew him. And you're already, you know, belittling his memory. How dare you? 
Well, Mrs. Jones, that's because the next door neighbor earned more, so she gets more. Oh, that gets you real far. That doesn't get you one inch from people in emotional distress. That's what you have to deal with on the money. But most of the time, when people come to visit me, they don't want to talk about money. Either, first, they want to vent about life's unfairness. Why my daughter, Mr. Feinberg, 19 years old, starting a new career as a lawyer, and she died in the rubble of the World Trade Center. Why? There is no God. Life is unfair. The government was asleep at the switch, and they bent on and on. You let them go. Let the steam out of the pressure cooker. Or they come not to vent. They come to see me to validate the memory of a lost loved one. Mr. Feinberg, I was married to my wife for 25 years. She died in the World Trade Center. And I want to show you a video of our marriage 25 years ago. Mr. Jones, you don't have to do that. It'll be very emotional and it won't have any bearing on compensation. Yeah, you're going to watch. I want you to show what those murderers did to my angel. Go ahead, Mr. Jones, show the film, show the tape. If you can, if you can handle the emotional impact of providing a hollow substitute for loss, money. If you can brace yourself to handle it, you can get through these programs. But I must say it's debilitating. And I was lucky. I had a loving family. And I had for nine, all of these programs. And I have the country behind me. And that's the last thing I want to say before I open it up for a few questions. People say, Ken, this movie work. What do you hope that it conveys on Netflix when you watch work? What do you hope comes out of watching the film? And I say the single most important lesson in modern America in watching that film just 20 years ago, the country as a whole rallied around the victims and the fun. There was no red state, blue state, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat. The entire nation as one community came together as one to support the victims, and reinforce the resolve of the team administering the fund. And that is the lesson. I wonder today in polarized America, whether you could ever quickly get agreement on a 9-11 victim compensation fund. I doubt it. But if anybody wants to have an idea of how the country rallied in support of the victims, and the country as a whole, that fund is the best example I know of as a teaching lesson today. I hope you'll read the book. I hope you'll see the movie. At my house, the movie runs on every TV 24-7. There's nothing else you can watch. You can't get the news because automatically Netflix, it just keeps running over and over again. Worth, worth, worth. And um, um, pleased and honored to join the Zionist Book Club. And I still have a few minutes for questions and I turn it back to Alan and Liz. Now I'd like to open this up uh, for questions and first call on Tyler Korn, um, who was your student at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Tyler, please unmute yourself and ask and, and go you. ahead. Thank you uh, so much, Liz, for organizing this. And thank you, Mr. Feinberg, for, for doing this with the ZOA. It was fantastic. I just briefly wanted to say, I, um, as I was telling you at the very beginning, I was a former student of yours at Penn Law, as Liz said. Your class on mass torts was amazing, and it was one of the highlights, genuinely, of my uh, law school education. And beyond that, 
um, you know, there are no coincidences in life. And a couple of years ago, a client of mine, which is a film producer called West Madison, told me about this movie that they were interested in helping to produce on none other than Kenneth Feinberg. And I was involved in the, um, in the financing of the project, very excitedly telling everyone who would listen that I once knew Ken Feinberg. And um, I, was, uh, I was even able to go to the filming in New York when they were filming uh, the theater scene with Michael Keaton. And uh, it was a real highlight. Our children were there on set, sitting in the director's seat, talking to Max Borenstein, the screenwriter, talking with the accent coach who tried to teach um, Michael Keaton how to speak like you. And um, I wanna say that uh, anytime uh, one, a person gets Batman to play them, that's a measure of true accomplishment in life. I do have a question, um, which is that in the movie, much was made, without giving anything away, much was made in the movie about a shift by you from an objective set of criteria to a subjective set of criteria. And um, that this was a type of, uh, you know, Hollywood style awakening by you. And I was wondering what your feelings were um, about that. How accurate or inaccurate was that? Well, thanks very much. It's a small world that our paths cross. And I'm glad to know that you succeeded in your professional career, notwithstanding my course at Mass Towards. <laughs> I also want to remind people, if they've read the book, that I learned about the 9-11 attacks at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I was coming out of my mass torts class when I saw that the first plane had hit the building. By the time I got to 30th Street Station to take the train back to Washington, the second plane hit, and we knew that this was not just an accident. When the train got to Wilmington, Delaware on the way back, that was it. The plane had hit the Pentagon. They shut down Amtrak, and we had to, a couple of friends and I, we just took a taxi back to Washington. Um, Tyler gives an example of an awakening that I had during the course of the movie and during the course of the fund, going from an objective criteria approach that I discussed earlier to a subjective approach. That's a perfect example of what I say is dramatic license. Even the movie doesn't, uh, doesn't say that I that I jettisoned the objective approach. You can't have jettisoned economic loss and pain and suffering. It is what it is. It's the American system. It's in the statute. The movie does show an evolving attitude towards victims by uh, Michael Keaton, uh, where the fund becomes much more empathetic. And I don't want to give anything away. So my answer, a good example of dramatic license. We always knew that empathy would be critical. It was us, not the statute, that created a hearing opportunity in the first place. There were no hearings required by the federal law creating the fund. We did that. So fair amount of dramatic license. But again, overall, a movie worth seeing and a movie that largely is effective in explaining the atmosphere and the challenges we confront. Okay, I, thank I just like John. thank. You. I just like to ask people to raise their hands if they have a question. And in the meantime, I see a couple of questions in the chat, so I'll I'll, I'll read those off. Or unless, let's see, Mr. Lipoff, I guess had had a question. Is uh, Paul uh, Lipoff? Uh, do you want to ask your question uh, live? If so, uh, unmute yourself. Otherwise, I'll read it. Mr. Lipoff. All right, I'll read this question, which is very good. Uh, two questions. Did your Jewishness uh, affect how the victims related to you? How has the experience of dealing with all these tragedies changed you personally? Finally, thank you for your work and service uh, to our country. You become much more fatalistic, I must say, in planning your future. I certainly have. 
you know, you see people who confront this horror, never anticipating for a second this curveball that would be thrown at them. And you realize when you do these funds, there's only so much you can plan before everyone sooner or later confronts some uh, unanticipated consequence of whatever they're doing. Fatalism uh, now sort of gird, reinforces my uh, approach to life, I think. Um, uh, the, the, the first part of the question, what was it, Liz, that he asked? At the about very how you, at, whether your Jewishness affected oh, you. Oh, yes. I grew up in Brockton, Massachusetts, a loving Jewish family in a city in the 1950s and early 60s that was a great place with, with uh, three synagogues, a, a very vibrant and optimistic Jewish community. And really what I learned about Judaism then that stood me in good stead with the 9-11 fund is how Jew the Jewish religion develops rituals towards death and the grieving, the shiva, the graveside service, guarding the body the night before burial. In other words, you don't grieve alone. The community around you will rally to your side and assist in the grieving process. You needn't grieve alone. And I must say that ritual that I remember as, as a, uh, a young, young man in, in, in Brockton stood me in very good stead in trying to come to the assistance at least of the grieving in 9-11. I think I can see that because when you go, when you go to a shiva, um, you you know the object is to listen to whatever the person wants to say, and that's what you did. You know, you described how you did that, and I think that's a very you know Jewish way of of trying to help people. You know, hey Liz, Liz, this is Paul Lipoff. Oh, uh, I, I appreciate the answers from uh, Mr. Feinberg, but my my question was more how the victims related to you as a Jew. How did that? Oh, okay. Color, color their emotions, and 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 do you think it made a difference? No. Thank you for, thank you no. for clarifying. Thank no. You for clarifying. Irrelevant. I, I, I don't think it mattered one whit what my religious background was or the degree of religious learning. I don't think my, now maybe existentially it may have made a difference. I don't know. But I never heard or felt that there was any victim that took particular solace or uh, help in my Jewishness. No, I don't think so. This was a secular program. And I don't believe that had uh, much of any bearing on anything. Uh, let's see, we have a, uh, Billa Spatz has uh, her hand up. Billa, uh, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, actually, I now that, that the question about the Jewish question came up, there was a scene in the movie, and correct me if I'm wrong, where someone may have said something about the fact that you were Jewish, and it was in a negative way. Am I correct? That's correct. There was one example, not when any individual victim came to see me, but during the town hall meetings that I conducted throughout the country right. to let everybody know about the program. Right. Uh, there was one anti-Semitic comment right. that was right. made. Right. Look, people are in grief, cut them some slack. Right. It was a one offhand comment. Right. Believe me, I made some comments that I regret unrelated to religion. But I mean, I made some comments I regret and um, you move on. But yes, okay. there was one I, anti-Semitic comment, I, but that I, was I isolated and we moved on. I understand. Oh, I want to say kol hakavad. And Yasha Kalach, if you know what all that means. Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, it was really, you know, very much. And I, I worked in surrogate's court as a court attorney referee. And I'm sure many of your, uh, your the settlements came through our court. Which surrogate's early, court? Uh, in Queens County. Oh, not in Judge Roth's Manhattan surrogate's Not Manhattan. Court. This was Queens yeah. County. Yeah, uh, very helpful. 
Yeah, so it was, uh, and uh, I was just, I did have one question about whether or not you had the help from any psychologists, other medical professionals, none at all. So now, some of the victims may have. Right. We didn't but offer I, that. We it's too bad. I think it. you certainly, you and your team certainly deserved it. <laughs> you know, you did an amazing job. And again, thank you for the work that you've done and for the work you'll continue to do, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Bill. Um, if I can, may ask a question. Um, yeah, I, one of the things that I thought was very inspiring was the chapter that you wrote and how different people coped um, with uh, <laughs> the incomprehensible. And uh, there was, you said that some people had an attitude of, let's don't let the terrorists win. We're going to go on with our lives. And I'm wondering. If, uh, but on the other hand, you spoke about people who were so depressed that they couldn't even fill out the forms and didn't even want the money. <laughs> and later on, there were a number of cases. And I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering, you know, if you stayed in contact with people and saw how that developed over time, if some of the people, you know, continued to have, you know, or if more people uh, started to have that, let's don't let the terrorists win attitude because you later on when information came out about Iran's involvement in 9-11, how they trained the terrorists in, uh, in Tehran um, to fly the planes, <coughs> excuse me, help them with their visas, help them with the travel arrangements. And there were a number of cases brought against Iran um, successfully in the uh, Southern District of New York. <coughs> Did you see an attitude change of um, people finally getting up and, and get participating also in the cases against Iran. Was there more of a, a development of an attitude of let, don't let the terrorists win? <coughs> Sorry, and related to that, I wanted to ask you what you thought of the, um, the amounts awarded in some of those cases, like the DeRubio case, it was 12.5 million for, for a spouse and 8.5 million for parent and child for solace, and 4.25 million for sibling. And then you also had the um, Ashton case, 2 million for pain and suffering, almost 7 million in punitives. You know, what you thought of those judgments, both, you know, the ability of people to sort of get up and go and, and to, 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 to start really fighting, you know, when, when they found out about Iran's involvement and the amounts that are awarded. Well, first of all, I want to start off by, uh making it clear to everybody, once the fund expired in 2000, December of 2003, mm -hmm. that's it. I never wanted to or expected to keep in touch with any of the victims. I thought it was ill-advised. Mm -hmm. One well-intentioned congressman from New York suggested a year later, let's have a reunion. I thought that was a horrible idea. People have to move on as best they can. This is not an anniversary that I think would at all be um, helpful mm -hmm. uh, to the victims and their families. So I can't tell you 20 years later, whatever happened to these folks, how they spent their money, whether they remarried, whether their children graduated from schools, I don't know. And I don't think it's appropriate, frankly. Mm -hmm. I've moved on and they should move on. Mm -hmm. Secondly, these awards that were received by default judgments where individual victims received compensation through a new program unrelated to the 9-11 fund, right. the United States Victim of State Sponsored Terrorism Act, mm -hmm. those default judgments are being now compensated from fines and, and penalties imposed on terrorist states and terrorist agents, and that's a separate program unrelated. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's not unrelated, actually, it is related, but it's a separate program. Right. And um, all power to those folks, if they can receive additional compensation or new compensation. But the most important point I want to make is, is once the fund ended, the original fund, by statute, it ended in December of 2003. Mm -hmm. That's it. Close the file. We did our job. We assisted as best we could. 
The program was unique. It should not be replicated. And let's try everybody, try and move on. And um, that's the position I've taken ever since. Mm -hmm. oh, by the way, in the chat, there are a lot of people thanking you for your service and, and, and how much, saying how much they appreciate your work on this. Just wanted to let you know that in, in, case, you haven't had a chance, in case you haven't had a chance to read the chat. Um, I know that you if I could figure out how to read the chat, maybe I would. <laughs> I mean, you know, that requires a certain degree of finger technology that I don't have. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, but I yeah. thank you all. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of just very quickly related to, to what I just asked. Was there also, you know, did some of the victims talk about, like, why aren't we suing the people responsible, you know, at the time when you were involved with this? I mean, oh. I know the information came out afterwards about Iran um, that, that really did come out until the 9-11 report in 2004. And then there was a lot more investigation. But Oh, no, within, within weeks after the uh, fund being established, there were lawsuits filed against Iran. Mm -hmm. and and Saudi Arabia, particularly right. Saudi Arabia. Right. And, and the law permitted victims who received compensation from the 9-11 fund. That did not mean they couldn't sue foreign perpetrators. And those lawsuits did commence, and some of them may still be ongoing. I do not know. Yeah, I think so. So. Anyway, I was wondering if you would, wanted to say a few words in conclusion, and then I'll tell everybody about our upcoming events. and. Uh... I know Just how um, how um, honored and pleased I was to participate in this very civilized idea, a daytime book club. I think it's a, just a terrific idea. I'm honored to be part of it. I was pleased to get the invitation. And in case you couldn't tell, I think I enjoyed the entire last hour more than the audience. But uh, in any event, I want to thank you, Liz and Alan and others. And it was a great pleasure to participate. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate your participation. We're so honored to have you here today. And yeah. uh, we really, it really is a great honor for us. And I wanted to let everybody know about our upcoming <laughs> events. Well, we have the ZOA Zoom Gala, which will be on December 19th. Um, and I believe uh, Alan's going to put that in, or has put that information in or can put that information in the chat again. Um, hope I, and it's also on our website. Hope everybody will sign up. We, ha we are having uh, Prime Minister uh, Naftali Bennett there. And uh, we're also having uh, who, uh, Mike Pompeo, a former Secretary of State, and many other uh, you know, superstars are going to be at the gala. And of course, our uh, um, Mark Klein, president of ZOA. Uh, and then we have uh, two book club events scheduled in January. Um, we've also put that information in the chat. Uh, the first one is sort of a combination book club advocacy re uh, event. And the uh, book club is actually, uh, the books are actually the briefs that were written in the uh, Students for Justice in Pal or the Fordham University versus Students for Justice in Palestine case should be very interesting. We're having Susan Tuckman, who's uh, the head of ZOA Center for Law and Justice, who wrote one of the amicus briefs, is going to be one of the featured authors. And the other featured author is uh, Peter Fishkind, who wrote another amicus brief on behalf of Fordham University. So that should be a very fascinating event, Wednesday, January 5th. And then on Wednesday, January 19th, we're having the son, unfortunately the author is deceased, but the son of Mordecai Hakon is coming to speak about his book, Homeland. Um, he was very involved in the clandestine, uh, clandestine immigration to Israel uh, during and after World War II, and when the British were barring the gates to Israel. And, uh, you know, and uh, was very involved in the early years of uh, Israel's founding or, or reconstitution, I prefer to say. And uh, that should be very, very interesting. We also have uh, uh, Israel Hakon, who's the son of Mordecai Hakon, has also donated many of the books to ZOA. So if you'd like to um, send a $50 contribution to ZOA, and if we, we can send you one of the books. Um, with this unusual, we haven't done that before. And uh, we hope to see you at those events and hope to see you at the gala. And thank you, Alan, do you wanna say anything about the gala quickly? I think you've covered it. It's just gonna be a wonderful, wonderful evening, Liz. Uh, you mentioned already that it's featuring uh, sitting Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, we're very excited. And former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. 
others, and uh, it'll prove to be an hour to an hour and 15 minutes of, uh, of great uh, Israel advocacy. I hope to see everybody there. And thank you, everybody. It's wonderful to see, it's wonderful to see everyone here.